Steinberg becomes the focus of public rage. I thought he ought to be boiled in oil for what he did to that little girl. But how responsible was the mother, Hedda Nussbaum? She was brutalized, but failed to help the child when she had the chance. I just became more and more brainwashed into believing that he was practically a god. There's no doubt in my mind that Joe killed Lisa. There's no doubt in my mind if left alone, Hedda would have been killed also. In 1987, Joel Steinberg and his common-law wife, Hedda Nussbaum, became household names in America. They were symbols of something that, at the time, had rarely taken center stage in such a notorious case, domestic violence. New Yorkers especially were mesmerized by Hedda Nussbaum's story of being beaten and tortured by Steinberg for over a decade. But that tale only emerged because of a more horrifying tragedy, the beating death of the six-year-old girl the couple had illegally adopted. An early Monday morning in Manhattan, November 2nd, 1987. Detective Bill Lackenmeyer was called to investigate a case of possible child abuse. A six-year-old girl had been rushed to New York's St. Vincent Hospital in critical condition. The cause? A severe blow to the head. She was comatose on a respirator. And I examined the child myself and noticed there were several bruises on her chest, some bruises on her back, and also, I believe, it was on the right side of her head. Obviously, the bruises to her face were the, the final bruises where you could actually see the imprint of a fist on her jaw. Her name was Lisa Steinberg. She was in the first grade. The detective learned that the girl's mother, 45-year-old Hedda Nussbaum, had made the emergency call but had stayed home with the couple's young son. The father, a 46-year-old attorney named Joel Steinberg, had only stayed at the hospital long enough to have a doctor tell him Lisa was in critical condition. Steinberg's response was something like, well, I guess you're telling me she's not going to be in the Olympics, but she might be okay. And we just thought it was a bizarre and inappropriate comment to make. I thought that um, Lisa would uh, probably have a recuperation period, but as Dr. Kalani said, she might have some neurological damage, but that'll be okay in a while. Then Steinberg had left the hospital and gone home. The young lady was there by herself. It doesn't make sense. God forbid if you have an injured child, people stay in the hospital for days. Uh, you don't just walk in and walk out. The detective went to the parents' apartment in Manhattan's Greenwich Village. Police were appalled by its squalid condition. In one corner was a playpen. A 16-month-old boy identified as Mitchell Steinberg was found tied to it in a soiled diaper and clothing. He was taken into custody. Hedda and Joel were driven to the 6th Precinct for questioning. At the station house, Detective Lackenmeyer found their behavior mystifying. He spoke with Hedda Nussbaum first. At no time up to this point had she asked me uh, how Lisa was doing in the hospital, which I found, again, very suspicious. Looking at her sitting there, I could see that she had definitely had a broken nose. She had black eyes. The woman appeared to have been severely beaten over a long period of time. Investigators suspected something was terribly wrong. Nussbaum rejected the notion that any abuse had taken place in the apartment. She actually talked in a programmed uh, manner. All she said was, uh, in quotes, Joel is a wonderful husband and father. He would never hit me or my daughter. For evidence purposes, police did a full examination of Nussbaum and videotaped it. The body of the 45-year-old woman was a catalog of injury and abuse. It appeared that clumps of her hair had been torn out. She had sustained numerous fractures to her ribs, nose, and jaw. Large bruises and scars covered her back, stomach, buttocks, and head. Most horrifying 
and his right leg was in the late stages of gangrene. I've never seen a person that received beatings like that. It, it, was, it was beyond comprehension that a person could walk and talk and have sustained all those beatings. The man believed to have inflicted the abuse, her common-law husband, Joel Steinberg, was also in the precinct. Detectives collecting fingernail scrapings from him noticed several fresh scratches on his fingers and knuckles. Lackenmeyer questioned Steinberg about his daughter's injuries. He more or less said, what injuries? And I says to her, face, head, back. He says, she didn't receive any injuries. She just stopped breathing because she was choking on food. Steinberg claimed he had called Nussbaum from a dinner engagement and learned that Lisa had gotten sick to her stomach. So I assumed, as I guess she did, that um, she had stomach upset. The detective didn't believe Steinberg's story. Choking on food would not cause that condition, which is completely nude, but there was caked on dirt on her legs and her feet, which is not normal uh, for a six-year-old child. A team of investigators armed with search warrants and a video camera the turn to the couple's apartment. Old electronics equipment, papers and dirty clothes covered the floors. There were blood stains on the walls. An exercise bar with hair and blood on it hung from a hook. Mitchell's playpen sat by a large desk. We found, I believe it was cocaine, uh, marijuana, and some other drugs. The apartment was, I've never seen an apartment in 22 years in a police department in any place, in the poorest of neighborhoods or the best of neighborhoods. It just was a filthy, filthy apartment. That same afternoon, both parents were charged with attempted murder, assault, and endangering the welfare of a child. The following day, Hedda Nussbaum was taken to a women's prison ward at Elmhurst Hospital for treatment of her own injuries. Joel Steinberg was held at Rikers Island. Six-year-old Lisa had sustained massive brain damage and was in a terminal coma at St. Vincent's. Three days later, doctors decided to remove her from life support. The charges against Steinberg and Nussbaum were upgraded to second-degree murder. The details of the case horrified the public, including New York City's mayor, Ed Koch. Well, I felt the pain at the time, as did every person living in New York City. If we could have, I want to tell you, although we wouldn't because we're not vigilantes here, we'd have strung them up. The story became a media sensation. There were those who said that Joel made the great white defendant in media terms, and it was a case that the press could milk and milk and milk some more, and they did. You know, it was shocking for everyone. I mean, I think it was shocking for women. It was shocking for professional women. It was shocking. Uh, she was Jewish, and he was Jewish. It's like, you know, we, Jews don't do things like that. On November 5th, 1987, six-year-old Lisa Steinberg died in a New York City hospital after being in a terminal coma for three days. Her parents, Joel Steinberg and Hedda Nussbaum, were charged with her murder. The story was splashed across the New York papers. There were newspapers with this woman on the front whose face was all battered, and I looked, and I didn't recognize her, but then I saw her name, and I stopped. Freelance writer Naomi Weiss had known Hedda Nussbaum since college, but had lost touch with her as most people had in recent years. Weiss immediately went to visit her friend in the hospital. She was unrecognizable. I mean, we're talking about a beautiful, tall, willowy, attractive, soft-spoken woman. The person I saw did not resemble Hedda Nussbaum at all. The question was played out again and again. How could this happen to a woman like Hedda Nussbaum? Nussbaum has rarely spoken to reporters about her case, but she did so for this episode of American Justice. I grew up in a working class family in New York City. My father was a hairdresser, my mother a housewife. My parents never, ever 
hit me, not even once. They were not abusive. There was no drinking in my family. They were very, I guess, conservative, upstanding, good people. Hedda attended Hunter College as an English major and in 1974 became an assistant editor of children's books for Random House in Manhattan. By her early 30s, the quiet and shy woman was feeling lonely and anxious to settle down. My former roommate and I had decided that we, we'd been looking to meet men. We both wanted to meet somebody to get married and went to uh, a couple of parties and it was at one of those parties that I met Joel. It was the spring of 1975. Joel Steinberg was a 34-year-old attorney living in Manhattan's trendy Greenwich Village. Investigative reporter Maury Terry interviewed Steinberg for Vanity Fair magazine. He had gone to school, was well educated, uh, went to law school, served, uh, served in the military during the Vietnam years and, and so on and so forth. I mean, on paper, he had, uh, you know, a very good background. I was very attracted to him right away, and we started going out. And after about a month, I broke it off because he kept pushing me, I felt, into wanting... He wanted to see me almost every night, and I did not want to get involved so quickly. Hedda simply found Joel too domineering, but she happened to run into him a few months later and gave him a second chance. I started seeing him and really fell head over heels. He was attractive. He was a lawyer. He was Jewish. He was a professional. He was earning pretty good money. I mean, what's not to like? Hedda was timid and reserved. Joel was just the opposite. He was helping me to come out of my shell. He would work with me nights like a therapist teaching me to be more assertive and more outgoing. And after we'd go to parties, he would critique me and say, you did this good, you didn't do that, and you should say this. And I really started to learn from it. There was obviously a need in her to have somebody to take over and direct her life. And, and Joel, by virtue of his personality, he was a very aggressive, controlling kind of guy. In January 1976, Les Baum moved into Steinberg's one-bedroom apartment on West 10th Street. The following year, Hedda was promoted to senior editor at Random House. She credited her success to Joel. I realized today that they wouldn't have given me promotions or raises unless I deserved it, but I didn't see it that way then. I just thought he was my everything, my savior. According to Nussbaum, after being together for three years, in March 1978, Steinberg struck her for the first time. She reported to a doctor that her boyfriend had hit her in the eye, but then insisted that the hospital form be changed to protect Joel. It started with very isolated incidents when Hedda would be struck by Steinberg. At, at first, uh, you know, he would be extremely apologetic. He would say that this would never happen again, and I think she believed him. By 1980, the couple was also abusing cocaine supplied by Steinberg's law clients, many of whom were drug dealers and mobsters. Joel began beating Hedda regularly. Nonetheless, Hedda says she grew even more attached to her lover. There was never a time during the relationship when I felt I can't stand this man. I, most women who were in abusive relationships after a while, they just can't stand the man to touch them. I never felt that way about Joel. I just grew to love him more and more. Hedda had hoped to marry Joel, but by 1981, she had given up. Joel refused to get married, and I went along with what he wanted, even though it wasn't what I wanted. And so even though we weren't married, I still wanted to have children. When I was 35, you know, the old biological clock was ticking. So we started trying and he wanted children very much too he got along great with kids when Hedda didn't conceive Joel contacted an obstetrician friend who promised him a baby on May 15th a one-day-old newborn girl was delivered to the couple's apartment it was an illegal adoption 
not approved by any agency. The couple named her Elizabeth Steinberg and called her Lisa. When the doctor and his wife brought her over and put her in my arms as the happiest moment of my life. Lisa spent the remainder of her short life watching the mental and physical deterioration of her mother at the hands of her father. And sadly, it's typical for abusive couples eventually to abuse their children as well. Investigators would try to build a case for murder with one glaring problem. The best eyewitness to what happened in the apartment said she was still in love with Joel Steinberg and that neither of them would ever have hurt Lisa. Back in a moment. Within days of Lisa Steinberg's murder in November 1987, her case grew to become New York's top story. That the system could fail this six-year-old child touched a raw nerve in the city. And this beautiful little uh, girl and the suffering that she went through and the fact uh, that uh, she fell through the cracks at school, at home, all of that caused enormous anguish with the public. Though both of her parents were charged with murder, public sentiment quickly turned against Joel Steinberg, particularly after photos of Hedda Nussbaum's battered body were made public. It was obvious for people to conclude or assume that Joel had done it. I mean, he's the, the one adult still standing, basically. It was like there was a collective anger at this beast Steinberg that filled the city. You could feel it. It was palpable. While many wondered if Lisa's death could have been prevented, the Steinberg's neighbors insisted they tried to help. I feel terrible. And we're all talking about what else we should have done. It didn't have to happen. The right people were notified. The child was not protected. Police officials like Bill Lackenmeyer believe that the family's problems simply fell through the cracks. It's easy to say now, we should have done this or we should have done that. The police should have picked it up because the police did respond to their apartment on several occasions. Uh, the Bureau of Child Welfare should have picked it up because they had numerous complaints, over a hundred from neighbors. Had it went to the hospital, the hospital should have picked it up. It just didn't happen. Women's groups and domestic violence activists leapt to Nussbaum's defense. She was offered free psychiatric treatment and legal advice. Prosecutors, after speaking at length with Hedda and reviewing the evidence in the case, wanted her to testify against Steinberg. We really felt that all the evidence pointed to the fact that Steinberg was the person that, that had struck the bow that killed Lisa. It was also clear to us that Steinberg was the decision maker. He was the guru, so to speak, both of, of Hedda and Lisa. And given that and given her physical and psychological condition at the time that uh, as a homicide transpired, the decision was made, not the prosecutor. Initially, Hedda refused to cooperate. Then, an article written with Joel Steinberg's cooperation appeared in Vanity Fair magazine. Steinberg told investigative reporter Maury Terry that he had nothing to do with Lisa's injuries. He said that he didn't know what happened. And if he insisted he didn't do it, well, then who could have done it? You know, although he would never point a finger at Hedda Nussbaum through the process of elimination, you'd have to say, well, he was really saying Hedda did it. No one has any idea to this day what happened to Lisa that night. I mean, all they have is an image of battered Hedda. Steinberg also claimed that his common-law wife was involved with a sadomasochistic cult. An informal kind of cult group that played mind games and programming games and hypnosis games and sort of a, the outgrowth of some sort of wacky therapy cult. On May 9th, 1988, Nussbaum's attorney, Barry Scheck, announced that Hedda would testify. Even so, Nussbaum says it took many more months of therapy before she was ready to tell her story. I continued to feel I was in love with him all that time. And then I think everything just sort of came together suddenly. I started writing and drawing in a journal. Then I started writing cursing at him. And then I turned the page and 
wrote to Lisa. I said, I'm sorry, Lisa, I'm sorry I didn't see this sooner. It's too late to help you, but maybe we can help another child. Nussbaum sat four hours with prosecutors, detailing how Steinberg's abuse of her slowly degenerated into extreme physical and psychological torture. She recounted how in 1982, as a result of Joel's beatings, she'd been fired from Random House because of frequent absences. Also, in the years leading up to Lisa's death, she rarely left the apartment, except at night to go to the grocery store. Steinberg began to exercise more and more control over her. She became more and more isolated from her family, from her friends. She did tell me about some of the most horrendous things that he would have her do. And, and how, I mean, he would burn her and he would cut her skin and wouldn't feed her and would make her take these ice cold baths. I think really over time I just became more and more brainwashed into believing that he was practically a god. Eventually I did believe that. By the mid-1980s, Joel had stopped taking Hedda out in public. She had become permanently disfigured from his abuse. And yet, by some accounts, Steinberg's relationship with his adopted daughter, Lisa, was affectionate, at least at first. They went to the park, they took pictures, they went to the zoo, they went sailing. I mean, she was a happy child. I think that Joel had something to do with that. From everything that anyone ever said about Joel's relationship with Lisa, it was a mutually loving relationship. As Lisa got older, Steinberg began bringing her to late night meetings with clients. A waiter at Manhattan's Knickerbocker Bar and Grill once recorded his own conversation with five-year-old Lisa on audio tape. Say hi. What's your name? Huh? Hi, Lisa. Say hi to Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Lisa's a little, a little girl. She's a customer here. So what are you doing here? Um, having dinner. Oh, she's having dinner. She's having dinner here at the Knickerbocker. <laughs> oh, you're so cute. Steinberg, in some ways, w w used her to uh, appear to be more of a, uh, more of a humane person, if you will, because he had this charming little daughter. In 1986, Joel and Hedda illegally adopted a second child, an infant boy they named Mitchell. Both parents were now regularly abusing cocaine. And then, at some point in 1987, according to Nussbaum, the abuse that had been heaped exclusively on her was turned on Lisa. I believed that Joel would never hurt Lisa, and I was wrong. It was only within the last year that uh, Lisa had, st had started showing signs of a bruise here or there or ill-fitting clothes or just dirty fitting clothes. I think it was just a progression uh, of a very sick, sick situation. Aside from Nussbaum's story, investigators also gathered evidence that something wasn't right between father and daughter. Two weeks before the murder, Joel Steinberg was driving back from a business trip with Lisa. A toll booth collector noticed that the little girl was crying thinking she might just have witnessed a kidnapping. The toll collector called ahead to state troopers who pulled over Steinberg's car. Joel, I believe, had told a story that Lisa was suffering from uh, a nerve condition that she had to get her neck uh, massaged. That's, that's what he was doing and that's what she was crying. Steinberg was questioned briefly, then released. Troopers took this photo of a smiling, seemingly happy child. Around this time, Lisa's school teachers began to notice strange small bruises on the six-year-old's face and body. This photo of a somber, unkempt Lisa was taken on a Friday during her class Halloween party. Lisa was the only one not wearing a costume. By the end of the weekend, she would be in a terminal coma. But who was responsible? Hedda Nussbaum was preparing to testify against Steinberg and accuse him of the fatal beating. She was the one person, obviously, that could say that Steinberg struck the child, that, that saw Lisa in the condition that she was immediately after the blow, and also placed Steinberg in the apartment at the time that the medical evidence demonstrated that the homicide was committed. 
But Steinberg's attorneys were developing a far different picture of the state's star witness. They would argue that in Hedda's battered state, she became jealous of the person who seemed to have usurped Joel's affections, her six-year-old daughter, Lisa. It's almost as if she took over the role that Hedda no longer occupied. And that's why I think Hedda hated Lisa. And that's why I think Hedda was quite capable of killing Lisa. American Justice will return in a moment with the trial of Joel Steinberg. In October 1988, New York attorney Joel Steinberg went on trial for the beating death of his adopted daughter, six-year-old Lisa. A recent state law allowed cameras in New York courtrooms. TV networks plan to preempt their regular shows in order to present live coverage of the star attraction. Steinberg's common law wife, Hedda Nussbaum. It was like the countdown to Super Bowl kickoff or something. Everybody was waiting for Hedda's appearance on the stand. Would she testify? Wouldn't she testify? In the first days of the trial, the DA's office dropped all charges against Hedda Nussbaum paving the way for her testimony against her former lover. With that, the proceedings took on the flavor of a well-cast drama. You had the perfect villain, Joel Steinberg, right down to his mustache. You had poor, helpless Hedda, in quotes, although actually she was very badly beaten. The prosecution argued that Joel Steinberg was guilty of second-degree murder, but he had exhibited depraved indifference to Lisa's life by injuring and then failing to help her. The medical evidence will show that prompt medical care would have saved her life. Steinberg's attorneys began the trial at a distinct disadvantage. Their client had been savaged in the press, and he was being uncooperative. Joel never came forward and said, here's what happened that night. If you have a client who's not going to communicate with you what actually happened, you're in trouble. At that point, there really wasn't a strategy. At that point, the strategy was attack their case, try and throw some doubt on the medical stuff, period. According to the prosecution, on the evening of November 1st, 1987, Steinberg struck Lisa twice in the face. She also suffered a severe blow to the back of her head. Then Joel went out to dinner with a client. Medical experts testified that only a physically strong person could have delivered a severe enough blow to cause the fatal injury. Investigator Bill Lackenmeyer testified to seeing fresh scratches on Steinberg's hands the day Lisa was brought to the hospital. Which did not really fit uh, for an attorney's uh, line of work. There's no doubt in my mind that Joe killed Lisa. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind if left alone, uh, Hedda would have been killed also. But prosecutors knew they had to explain why Hedda who had been left behind with the injured child, had done nothing to help. So they showed the jury the video of Hedda's injuries taken the day of the arrest, insisting she was too afraid of Joel Steinberg to save her daughter. It was important, I think, to show two things. One, Hedda's physical condition, and secondly, her psychological state of mind to have endured what she endured for the number of years that she did. The thing started to unfold. It just got more horrific and horrific and he was a big lawyer and it was like this house of horrors going in there it was very unsettling and uh, almost hard to believe a month into the trial on december 1st 1988 the state called its most anticipated witness you could have heard a pin drop people were on you know, the edge of their seat the whole time. And I said, no, Joel said he would take care of her. He she looked haggard and worn, and she didn't look normal. I thought at that time that I had come really far and was healed and was in really good shape. But when I see the videotape now of me, I realize that I was still, to me, I look like a zombie. My, my, my voice is flat. My expression is flat. There's no life in me. The prosecution had Nussbaum described the night of her daughter's fatal injury. She told the court that around 5 o'clock, Lisa asked, Do you think Daddy is going to take me with him tonight? 
Nussbaum told the girl to go ask her father. At that point, Lisa entered the couple's bedroom while Hedda went to the bathroom. The next thing was that Joel came into the bathroom carrying Lisa in his arms. And she was lying in his arms limp. And I said, what happened? He said, what's the difference what happened? This is your child. Hasn't this gone far enough? Nussbaum said Joel then left for a business dinner. She spent the next three hours in the apartment with Lisa, who never regained consciousness. Then had to made a shocking admission. I realized that no matter what I did, it didn't seem to make much difference, so that I didn't need to work with her every minute. And I wanted to keep busy, so I, I rearranged some of Joel's files. While Steinberg was out, Nussbaum never called 911 to get help for her daughter. And I started thinking, shall I call 911 or, or Dr. Heiss, who was a pediatrician? And I said, no, Joel said he would take care of her. He'd get her up when he got back. And I didn't want to show disloyalty or distrust for him, so I didn't call. You could say that she realized that it was a big mistake and but she was so far down in that Joel Steinberg hole she couldn't she couldn't think properly to summon help when it was needed during Hedda's second day of testimony the court learned other disturbing details about the night of the fatal beating even when Joel finally returned home from dinner neither he nor Hedda called to get help for Lisa instead they freebased cocaine while Lisa lay unconscious on the bathroom floor. Mr. Steinberg smoked for a number of hours until the cocaine was, that we had was gone and I uh, smoked a, very, a small amount. The couple only called for help after they noticed that Lisa stopped breathing at 6.30 the next morning. So was there a window of opportunity after that blow for her to be saved? Yes. The fact that she was left unattended made that uh, rescue impossible. To try to account for Nussbaum's behavior, prosecutors pointed to her violent relationship with Steinberg, attempting to prove that she was entirely under his power. There was a period when Joel made me sleep in the bathtub. When I would displease him, the first time he would say no breakfast and I couldn't have any breakfast then no lunch no dinner next would come no blanket the prosecution argued that it was primarily Joel's responsibility to call for help since Hedda was mentally and physically disabled what we felt was that not only had Steinberg committed a crime of commission by actually striking Lisa, but he had, he had also had a duty to render help to her as her father. He waited for hours and hours and hours while her condition worsened before he finally sought help. During cross-examination, the defense began to hone in on a strategy. They did not dispute that Steinberg had beaten Hedda Nussbaum, but they did hint that she was hiding something. And here's this poor woman, she's so abused, how could she possibly not listen to Joel, who would have, you know, blowtorched her again? But that's never what she said. The defense questioned Hedda about her feelings regarding Joel and Lisa's relationship. They attempted to show that she was jealous of her daughter. Have you ever on any occasion talked about a jealous feeling that you had about Lisa regarding her relationship with Joel? No. Based on their pretrial interviews with Steinberg, the defense questioned Nussbaum about her alleged involvement with cult groups. Nussbaum responded that the cults were a figment of Steinberg's imagination. She said Joel had convinced her that she had the power to hypnotize people. Joel believed in Hedda's involvement in these cultish groups and strange powers she had over Lisa to repress Lisa's bodily functions even had his own testimony that night has Joel saying now look what you've done and it doesn't say Joel was out of his mind and came into the room and accused me of something I hadn't done 
As the defense presented its case, the strategy was clear. Blame Nussbaum for Lisa's death. The defense called two New York City police officers who testified that they saw Nussbaum sitting alone in a car outside her apartment on the night of Lisa's fatal beating. Nussbaum had told the jury that she hadn't left the apartment all night. Their testimony was significant because it fit the picture. It fit the picture of the person who was wrong, uh, running away from her wrong. The defense also called a cabaret singer and friend of Steinberg's named Marilyn Walton. Hedda had insisted that she never hit Lisa, but Walton told the court that she saw Nussbaum strike the child when she was two years old. She pushed her and shoved her, and then she threw her across the room. And as a result of that, I told her if she ever laid another hand on Lisa, I would put my foot where the sun didn't shine. We had interviewed Marilyn Walton ahead of time. We, we didn't find her to be a credible witness, frankly. And uh, we, we had spoken to the police officers, and we felt that they were mistaken. Finally, the defense attorneys called a medical expert of their own, Dr. John Plunkett, who testified that someone of Hedda's size and condition could indeed have caused Lisa's injury. It raised the possibility that Hedda did it. It raised the, the, the concept that Joel wasn't trying to cause this tremendous harm that they accused him of. I and mean, the accusation was ludicrous, that this was a murder. We felt that with the, the pattern of abuse that had been demonstrated with Steinberg's failure to render help for Lisa for that period of time, really all the circumstances that we uncovered, that that was an appropriate charge. After three months of testimony, on January 23rd, 1989, the case finally went to the jury. Back in a moment with the verdict in the conclusion of a family secret, the death of Lisa Steinberg. On January 23, 1989, the New York City murder trial of attorney Joel Steinberg went to the jury. He was charged with the second degree murder of his adopted daughter, Lisa. Half of the people thought that Joel was innocent, or maybe Hedda did it. I couldn't believe that these people had sat in the same courtroom with me for these three and a half months and come away thinking that anybody else in the world could have possibly have done this but Joel. But lo and behold, they had. Dr. Hayes, was a pediatrician. The most volatile issue turned out to be the testimony of the state's star witness, Hedda Nussbaum. The men in the jury could understand how she would not get help because, you know, 10 years of this sort of torture and abuse. And she honestly also believed that Joel could cure her, the Lisa. So she didn't do anything about it. But the women on the jury hated Hedda. They thought she should be prosecuted. They couldn't possibly understand under any circumstances how she could have sat there and let Lisa die without doing anything. Juror Alan Jared says the jury decided to disregard Nussbaum's testimony entirely and focus on the medical evidence. After eight days of bitter deliberations, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. In the end, Jared says they accepted the prosecution's claim that only someone of Steinberg's strength could have caused Lisa's life-threatening injuries. But they also decided that Steinberg's actions did not meet the technical requirements for second-degree depraved indifference murder. Instead, they found him guilty of the lesser charge of first-degree manslaughter. Guilty. As long as he went in the room to cause her bodily harm, then that was, we could convict him on the manslaughter charge. We did not think he went in there to murder her, but he went in there to hurt her and shut her up. Judge Harold Rothwax sentenced Steinberg to between eight and a third and 25 years in prison and recommended that Joel serve the maximum term. Steinberg pleaded with the judge that he was an excellent father. Lisa was consistently described by everybody, everybody as a delightful, happy, beautiful child. Children don't get that way without constant love. Lisa had that care for me. If there was anything wrong with Lisa when I left, or I was aware of it, I would not have left. Few defendants have so richly deserved that maximum sentence. 
he has shown himself to be, as we said in court, a self-centered, insensitive, remorseless killer. Steinberg began serving his sentence. He believed he'd been tried and convicted by the media. They destroy, and they don't give fair understanding and fair representation to people. And that's where I, I'm angry, and that's where I place my blame. Public reaction to the verdict was mixed. Many believed the jury was wrong to convict Steinberg of manslaughter, not murder. Police and child welfare authorities were also criticized for allowing Lisa's case to be overlooked until it was too late. The case inspired New York state lawmakers to stiffen penalties for child assault. Policies have changed. You take immediate action. And that's, that's what I think one good thing, if anything good come out of this, it was the awareness of the public uh, to the problems of abuse and child abuse and, and spousal abuse. People who might otherwise have looked away uh, with respect to other cases were, were more aware now of their responsibility. Following the trial, Hedda Nussbaum dedicated herself to educating others about domestic violence. A lot of women who were being abused wrote to me. I probably got a total of about 200 letters. And some women would write to me and said, I did it, I left him. In the couple of years following the case, in which I would hear a woman on the witness stand say, well, I wasn't as badly beaten as Hedda Nussbaum. She became the outer limit, in some sense, the most severe example of what could happen. In November 1988, Nussbaum filed a suit against Joel Steinberg, charging him with physical and psychological abuse. But New York state law sets a one-year statute of limitation on civil suits involving assault. There was no special provision for domestic violence victims. Nussbaum challenged the law, and in March 1997, the New York State Supreme Court ruled in her favor. This ruling is not only for me. It's for thousands of other battered women who have been silenced by abuse for such long periods of time. She won the right to sue Steinberg, but because he was now indigent, she decided to drop the case in the end. But the tragic circumstances that occurred in this New York apartment building remain strong in the city's memory. The case left me with a very bad taste in my mouth because there were no heroes at all in this story. Everybody lost. Nobody won. But the one who lost most of all was Lisa. There hasn't been a year that's gone by when there hasn't been a battered child. So until we reach the point where there are no battered children because of all the safeguards that we've put in, we must not rest. On June 30th, 2004, Joel Steinberg was released from prison after serving 15 and a half years behind bars. Under New York state law, inmates who serve two-thirds of their maximum sentence with good behavior are automatically granted conditional release. But Steinberg's troubles are far from over. Residents of the Manhattan community to which he moved immediately protested his presence. And in 2003, following a wrongful death lawsuit brought by Lisa's biological mother, a judge ruled that Steinberg pay $15 million in damages. Hedda Nussbaum, meanwhile, who said she would flee New York rather than face Steinberg again, has reportedly gone into hiding. For American Justice, I'm Bill Curtis.